Hi, everybody. My name is Bob Scarano. The name of my talk is Organizing Code, Organizing Code for Cross-Platform Web and Mobile Development. Thank you all so much for coming out today. Uh, my talk is at a special time today at the conference because I am the last thing standing between you guys and free food and beer. Um, so all you got to do is hang in there. And uh, now that I've got your attention, let's talk about this really long title. Um, so today we're going to be talking about an approach to writing apps that work on both your web browser and work in your mobile apps. And um, so maybe a better and shorter name for this talk is probably just how we do cross-platform. So this topic comes up a lot when I talk to people who write JavaScript at React Native conferences. After all, our web apps are written in JavaScript and our React Native apps are written in JavaScript. So of course it's natural that we want to share some code. Why can't we? So I'm going to talk today about some things that we've tried, um, things that we didn't do, and things where we landed on how we build cross-platform components at Squarespace. So I'm a team lead at Squarespace on the mobile content editing team. This is a really cool photo of our mobile team in cupcake formation, because cupcakes are amazing. And this is me staring directly into the sun during the last solar eclipse, wearing last year's Chain React uh, t-shirt. I was wearing the safety glasses. Uh, so up until a couple of years ago, I was writing nothing but native apps. I was writing iOS apps in Swift and in Objective-C. And even before that, before there were even iPhones, I was writing straight C and C++. And I know a lot of you guys out there are probably JavaScript developers who know React really well and want to, know, want to use your skills in React to write some really cool mobile apps. But I'm completely different. I'm a mobile developer, and I'm looking at React Native from a, from a native developer's perspective. And so while JavaScript is a language that I've always had experience with, it was still kind of a leap to go from being a native developer to learning modern JavaScript, learning React, learning React Native, but it all worked out. So I get to work with a lot of other teams who are building really cool stuff in JavaScript. This is a, uh, this is a web app for editing your website built by our CMS team. Uh, this is an engine for editing your website, uh, adding blocks to a page, customizing its content, and it's really just beautiful. And so this team shares a lot of common missions with my team. Their mission is to build tools and systems to interact with your content on the web, and my team's mission is to build tools so that you can interact with your content from a mobile phone. Another team that I get to work with that writes a lot of really great JavaScript is called Forms and Fields. Um, these guys pioneered a lot of the work about sharing code between web and mobile. And they probably understand all the nuances between iOS and Android and web development probably more than anyone in our company. And so this is our mobile family portrait. We've got a pretty big array of apps that are really focused and serve distinct purposes for our users. And on my team, the mobile content editing team, we're responsible for building experiences so you can work with your content on your phone. Our mission is to enable you to create, access, and change your content wherever you are when you're on the go. And I'm lucky enough to work with a pretty diverse array, a diverse, talented team of Android, iOS, and JavaScript engineers. And it's our goal to build our next generation of apps, sharing as much code as we can with our web team. Instead of making three separate implementations, what we'd love to do is share code. So even before there was React Native, we were building apps that shared node modules between our web and our mobile apps. What you're seeing here is a blog post editor. We can add an image. We can rearrange content, and this is a hybrid app. This app was, has native code. It has JavaScript code that's running in a web view. The JavaScript lives in a web view and communicates with the native layer, layer over a well-defined bridge. This should seem familiar if you guys have played with any React Native before, which I hope you have. So this talk is in three parts. The first part is an architectural talk. We're going to cover some choices that you have, and we'll talk about the choices that we landed on. Next, we're going to talk about JavaScript. We're going to build a sample component together that's cross-platform for web and mobile. And then finally, we're going to talk native. And we're going to talk about how you integrate your components with a native app. So write it three times. 
Let's talk about how we used to have to write these apps. So this is just how you used to have to do it. You'd write your app one time in JavaScript for the web, you'd write it another time in maybe Kotlin for Android, and then one more time for good luck, you'd write it in Swift. And you know, it's so inefficient to write our apps three times. We wind up with three different sets of code bases, three sets of implementations, and let's face it, we have three different sets of bugs. <laughs> so what did we do to address this? So let's, let's first look at something we all know. What happens if you do React Native init for a new awesome project, you've all done this a million times, and you hit npm install? So the first thing, of course, is you get your node modules folder it has all of your dependencies in it, has your application's dependencies, and most importantly, it has React, and it has React Native modules in it. Next, you have your native classes. These you can choose to never touch, except maybe to link maybe a native module if you have to, but if you're like us, you might choose to expand out this native layer and build yourself a hybrid app. And then finally, we have the components of your app. This is where your app declaration lives, and this is where your platform-specific components for your React Native app lives. We all know this. And if you did a good job, you start off your packager, you fire up Xcode, you run your app, and you get our familiar welcome screen. So now let's compare that with what happens when you create a new React.js web app. So we do a similar thing. We do create React app, another awesome project. We npm install. And once again, we have our node modules folder. We have our React module. Instead of a native app on top, now we have the bones of a web app. This is where all of your platform-specific web and components are going to live. And so that we fire up our server, we open our web, we will open up our web browser, and we see that our app is running, and we're really happy. So, but when we compare the architecture of our React Native app with the architecture of our React.js web app, we see that at the application layer, we have two different sets of implementations on two different platforms. And so it's our first impulse to want to merge these together into a single cross-platform module. Wouldn't it be great if we only had to write our components one time, and we deploy it everywhere, and it looks exactly the same on every platform? We could even power it with using one of those platform normalization layers. We know them, React Native Web, there's React Native Primitives, and this creates that common component language for all of our platforms. But this didn't work for us. Writing it one time really didn't work. Our design goals were not to have a consistent UI across all platforms. We wanted to have experiences that were special for each platform. We wanted something special on mobile, and we, uh, we wanted something special on the web. We also wanted to build it using tools and methods that we already knew. We wanted to be able to use CSS for the web. We wanted to be able to use our React Native controls on mobile. But we still wanted to be able to share code between these platforms. So what did we do? We took another approach. Our approach was to extract out the shared business logic into its own layer, into a shared layer component. This is where all of the shared logic that doesn't involve UI is going to live. On top of that, we build platform-specific components on top of it. This lets us build code in an uncompromising way. We can use the tools that we're already familiar with. And this lets us go on to compose more complex cross-platform components by combining these platform-specific components together. So now we can create these really rich and complex components that look great on any platform, but the business logic only needs to be written once. So this is a link picker component. We built it for the web, and it looks amazing. But this is the same component on mobile. And what's great is it looks and feels amazing on mobile as well, but it has a distinct mobile experience. It still shares a large amount of code with the web component cousin. There's a lot of business logic going on here. We're hitting endpoints. We're parsing JSON. We're turning it into model objects and building a hierarchy, and we're maintaining all this state. And what's great is we only need to tackle this problem one time. And then on each platform, we can worry about how to present it to the user in a platform-specific way. 
So we're not really writing it three times anymore, but we're certainly not writing it one time either. So I guess you could say, it's safe to say, we're writing it about one and a half times. And what I mean is, you can share about 70% of your code between platforms, and the remaining 30% is what we rewrite on each platform in a platform-specific way. And this 30% consists mainly of UI rendering code and some compo component interaction code. And that's a lot better than the 0% we were doing before. And this still lets you do things the right way for the right platform. So let's take a quick look at how we organize our code to do this. So this is the basic folder structure of one of our modules. You see there's a shared folder, there's a React Native folder, a web folder, and a package JSON at the root. The package JSON at the root is used to declare global dependencies, and it's also used to have some helpful run scripts that we use for watching and building and initializing. The shared folder contains our shared business logic. This is the basis that we build all of our platform-specific components on top of. And the web and React Native folders contain platform-specific components. These are composed from the shared components and from other platform-specific components to build new and more rich components. Each folder has its own package JSON with their own platform-specific dependency declarations. So that's our folder structure. Now let's talk about how we're configuring Babel to let these folders work together. So here's an example of our .babelrc file for our React Native target. And what you can see is that we've defined a target alias that points at our React Native folder. For the web, we do the exact same thing. We have a target alias, but this time it points at our web folder. So now our shared code can import a thing from a target, and depending on what target you're compiling for, you'll get the right thing. So let's make this real. Let's build a component together. This is the JavaScript section of our talk. So let's build a component that accepts keyboard input, and as you type, it formats it as a telephone number. Uh, first, we're going to start with the base shared implementation. We're going to make a new file. We're going to call it telnum input.js, and we're going to put it in our shared folder. And this new component is just going to extend a basic component. So now we have an interesting import. Already we see that we're importing from, the, now remember this is our shared cross-platform layer, but we're importing a platform-specific thing using our target alias. So in this case, we're importing a number loader. It has to be loaded somewhat different on the web versus React Native. And what's cool is we can just use this target alias, and it knows to do the right thing. And so now we're going to implement some functions. This is, again, in our shared implementation. We have a component we'll mount. We're going to make an instance of uh, that thing that we just imported. Then we'll make a helper function. This helper function is going to be called from our platform-specific components. In this case, this is a format function. It returns back a formatted version of the text that you typed as a telephone number. And so that's it for our shared business logic. This is a simple example, of course. So now it's time to make our React Native implementation of our telnum input component. So this time we're going to make a file. It's going to live in our React Native folder. And we're going to call it the same thing, telnum input.js. We're going to call the class the same thing. It's called telnum input and extends the basic component. But what's cool is these two imports. So the first import, import is importing from our shared library. This is all the business logic. The second import is a platform-specific string input field that we've already created. Let's pretend it already exists. And so we're pulling in things from both places. The implementation of our mobile telnum input field is made up of only a single render function, and that's great. If that's the only thing that's different between our web and our React Native implementation, that means we did a good job of separating out our business logic. Within our render function, the first thing we do is we call that format function that lives in our shared business logic. And because this is shared business logic, it'll work the same regardless of which platform that it's running on. And finally, we return the string input field, but it's configured specifically for mobile. So you'll see there's a few props here, auto-capitalize, auto-correct, keyboard type, and these are specific to mobile. And what's interesting is that only this platform-specific implementation needs to know about these properties. And so here's our component running in a storybook. And I'm just typing, and it's formatting as I type, and it's doing the right thing, just as we expected. 
this, uh, this is a storebook. So now let's do the same thing for our web component. This time we're going to make a telnum input component. It's going to be in our web folder. It's going to have the same file name. It's going to have the same class name. And the good news is that it's almost identical to the same class that we made for React Native. You'll even notice that um, as we make our new telnum input in our web folder, um, that the imports, the imports and the class declarations are pretty much exactly the same. And now in our web-based version of the component, the whole implementation, again, is just our render function. We call our, the first thing we do is we call our base class implementation uh, format, um, and it's gonna have the same business logic regardless if we're on the web or if we're on React Native. And this time, we're returning a string field that is configured using properties specific to the web platform. We have a class name, we have HTML attributes, and we have a type. And again, this is only in this platform-specific implementation of this field. And so here's the web version of our telnum input running in a storybook. And you can see the formatting logic works exactly the same as we type, just as we expected, but the styling and the configuration is specific for the web. So once we've built a bunch of components, and they're all working cross-platform, we can just publish them internally as a node module and have them used by all of our apps. And if we're building a purely greenfield React Native application and all of your application code is going to be in JavaScript, then we already have everything that we need to start our app. We can continue by adding just JavaScript components to our app without worrying much about the native app. Maybe you might have to link in a native module here or there, but that's all you really need to do. But if you're like my team, then you may also be developing code on the native side. There are some experiences that are just a lot easier to do on the native side. There's also some libraries that we already have that live in native, such as our networking, our persistence library. And frankly, we've built up libraries over years that we just want to leverage and use in our app. But the great thing about React Native is we can choose to go native when we want to or stay in React when we want to. So this is an example of a hybrid app. But if you're building a hybrid app, or even if you're building a mostly JavaScript app that has a little bit of native code in it, then your work is not done yet right after you've done publishing your component library. You still need a way for your React components to play nicely with native. So next, I'll talk about some strategies in code to help with this native integration. And what we're showing here is that our React components need some kind of native representation. That native representation is usually a native view that wraps all the boilerplate of React Native and abstracts the component as if they were just any other native view. There's generally two ways of doing this that I've seen, and they're both pretty similar. So the first one I kind of call a mono wrapper. I think this is what a lot of people do. This wraps everything into a single dependency. This contains all the native code from the modules that we import. This includes React Native itself. It includes any other dependencies that you have that are native that come along with it. It would have all the applications NPM dependencies. And this would also include your cross-platform component library. And it would also wrap all of your applications components. And what's great about this is that you can just do this one link dependency between your app, and your app doesn't have to know really anything about React Native at all. The dependency module exposes a native wrapper that contains view controllers for your high-level features and integrates nicely into your app. And this approach is probably great for most teams who are building hybrid apps. But we had to take a slightly different approach with our apps. We wanted to build a module library. We wanted to be able to individually select components that we wanted, and we want to share this module library across different apps. This allowed us to keep our bundle sizes small and allowed us to share these components across multiple apps. But in order to do this, that means that your app has to have some more React Native, native knowledge. You have to define a package JSON. You need to create your app.js, and you need to import and register the components that you want to use. So there's a little more knowledge that's going to be in your app, but what you get is you get to pick exactly what you need inside of your app. And we develop the components of our app into their own module, and then we import these components into our app. We do this as a separate module so the application logic can work in both our Android and our iOS apps. 
We also built a React Native toolkit that contains a small library of native helper classes. For wrapping React Native components in Native View Controller classes, it helps us reduce a lot of the boilerplate we have with using React Native. And really importantly, it helps uh, with methods for facil facilitating communication between the React layer and our native layer. So this is generally how we lay out one of these components that have a native wrapper around it. So at the root of the module folder, you'll find the JavaScript implementation for your component and our index.js so that it can be imported. And then what you'll also see is platform-specific folders. So we'll have an Android folder, an iOS folder, and in these platform-specific folders, we'll have one wrapper that is used so it can be used inside of native. So now let's take a look at one of the implementations of these wrapper that uses our React Native toolkit. So first we make a new class that extends the base React View Controller. This React View Controller, of course, is part of our React Native toolkit, and the class, the class itself, that React View Controller, extends a native view controller so that it can play nicely with your native app. So there's minimally only two things that you need to override. You need to provide to this the name of the component that you want to bring to life, and you need to give it the props that your component is going to want when you create it. Another super helpful utility is our React bridge that provides a singleton React Native bridge for your app. So if a bridge instance is not explicitly given to one of your components, we'll use this shared instance. And that's good because you can be sure that your bundle is only loaded once if you have multiple instances of your component on the screen at, same, at the same time, and you can be sure that there's only gonna be a single JavaScript context running. So another thing that the React View Controller does for us is it helps for routing function calls from JavaScript up to a specific instance of one of your wrapped React components. So let's see why this might be challenging. So in this case, we have two instances of the same component that might exist at the same time in your app. And each of these components has a React View Controller wrapper. And we've instantiated these components from the native side. And so normally, whenever you want React to talk to the native side, you have to create yourself a native module manager. And that provides the interface that React uses to call up. But now, I'm going to read a couple of lines from the React Native documentation about native module documentation. I'll do this really quick. So native modules are Objective-C classes, they actually can be Swift also, that are available in JS. And typically, one instance of each module is created per JS bridge. And the fact that native modules are singletons limits the mechanism in context of embedding. And that said, we would need to keep a mapping from identifiers to native views in the module. So this is done for a good reason, but it does complicate our implementation when we're doing embedding, and we have more than one instance of this component on our screen at a time. So what the documentation is saying is that when you make a function call up from native, there's only this one singleton instance of your manager. And it's up to you to figure out how to route these function calls to which instance that it needs to go to. The documentation is suggesting that you make a map, and for every instance that you create, you put it into the map. The key to the map can be any unique value that you want. We use a UUID, it could be the tag ID of your root view controller, and we call this key a reference. And this reference is passed down into the component when we create it. And so once it's passed down into the component, when we need to make a call up, we just, so this is an example of calling up into native, we just pass that reference back when we make the call. We're of course leaving out the, uh, well, well, we'll get onto this. So actually, so what's interesting is you need to actually declare this twice. You need to declare it once in your native module manager, and then you need to declare it again in your component that actually does the work. So this is an example of how you would do that mapping if you had to write it all by hand yourself. Um, when you're embedding components, the only purpose of this native module manager is to route the call to the right instance that you want to use. So the first thing that, that this function does is it looks up the instance in our reference map using that reference. And once we have the object, we can call a function that we really wanted, we can pass all the arguments that we received, and we can just leave out that first reference parameter. And so here's the implementation in our wrapper that's doing the real thing on the native side. In this case, it's just saying hello. So this is like the round trip going from, well not the round, this is the whole trip calling from React up into native to do a thing. So 
that's a lot of boilerplate. We recognize this. And the purpose of the wrapper is to take care of a lot of that for us. So one of the nice things about this wrapper, what it does for us, is it handles that reference mapping for us automatically. So inside of the wrapper's implementation is this function called props with reference. And its job is to grab the props that we declared in our component, and then using a helper called object reference, we create that reference string given that instance, and then we insert this reference into the actual props that we're gonna send to our component. And so now when we create a React Native view, you'll see that we're passing the component name that we originally created in our component, and we're passing this prop, props with reference function that has the injected reference ID inside of it. I should point out that even though this is Swift code, we do the exact same thing on Swift and on Android in a Kotlin. So a few slides back, I showed how you had to actually declare your native functions twice. So we created a little helpful macro that reduces some of that boilerplate called a, a callback method. This implementation does the work of looking up the object on the map. It does the job of copying all the incoming arguments to the outgoing function call, and it does that all automatically for you. So the first argument to the macro is the signature that you're exposing to React. This is the function that you actually call. You'll see that the first argument is that reference argument, and then anything else are all of the user arguments that you need to pass into your function. The second argument is the data type of the wrapper that you have. And the third argument is the signature of that function inside of your wrapper class. And so when you declare this macro inside of a native module declaration, it'll create all the functions for you automatically. All you need to do is focus on the implementation of what you need to do when React is asking native to do a thing. So we've covered a lot. We've talked about architecture and why we chose to go with our particular implementation of one and a half times. The main takeaway here is that uh, by breaking out code into a shared business module, you're free to develop UI code that's specific for the platform that you need in the way that you want to. We built a cross-platform component together and saw it running in the browser and a mobile app. The main takeaway here is that you know you've done a good job the co of code separation when you only need to write the UI code. And finally, we've talked about native integration and showed our React Native toolkit that makes integration easier. And the main takeaway here is that your work is not done after you've built your component, and it's important to think about how these components are gonna play nicely with your native app. Well, that's it. This is my red screen of thank you. Hopefully I didn't trigger anybody. The slides are here if you want them.